Bibles, please, to Mark or to Luke 11. Uh, will you turn with me, please, to Luke 11 as we continue on in our study in the Gospel of Luke. This is um, kind of a, it's a continuation from uh, a message that uh, I preached just before Joanne and I left and uh, went to visit the kids. And I kind of hope that uh, preaching is like riding a bicycle, that uh, you don't forget how to do it after you get away from it for a little while. So we're back in Luke 11. Will you turn with me there, please? Luke 11, we're looking at uh, verse 37 through 44. And uh, just before we take some time to look into the Word, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come to your Word. And we know that we need your Word. We know that we need your Son, the living Word. And I pray that we would be people who are very aware that our life is not only intellectually aware that our life is from Christ, but aware at the very depths of who we are that Jesus Christ is our only hope. I pray that uh, you would teach us now as we come into your word. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, it's like kind of a funny trail, and I won't take too long on this, but uh, as Kate sang for us, and we had the opportunity to hear that song, I hope that what happens is when uh, when someone sings, uh, we have the uh, we, we think of it far less from the perspective of performance, and far more from the perspective of really digging into what it is that we're hearing and considering the truth of that as it, as it comes to being worshipers. Because uh, I think that that song, if you, if you stop and think about it, uh, we know that all we have ultimately is Christ. Uh, we know that every other place where people might put their hope is temporary, it's going to break down, it's going to fail. Uh, Jesus Christ is our only hope, and it's a, it's a good thing to be able to take, and as someone worships in that way, to participate alongside them and think about those truths. We're, at, we're in Luke 11. I'm going to read for you verse 37 through 44. It says this as we start. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. The Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools! Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give his alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seed in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. I, I wanted to read that last verse so that we're very, very clear on the nature of the interaction that's taking place here. The last time that we were together, the last time I had the opportunity to share with you from God's Word, we looked at the first few verses of this passage. Maybe you remember, a, a Pharisee, one of the religious leaders of that day, had asked Jesus to dinner. But as I explained before, this wasn't your normal have a friend over kind of meal. This was more like a blood sport with spectators. Meals like this would be held in the outside courtyard of the host's home. A crowd would gather to watch adversaries engage in a battle of words, and the Pharisees were determined to destroy the reputation of this dusty, wandering rabbi who had cut into their popularity and was attracting away their followers. This was not a friendly meal. Of course, Jesus knows this. So he goes on the offensive right away. In the process, he makes himself a very uncomfortable dinner guest. He calls the religious leaders fools, which, by the way, is a right reserved for Christ alone as the judge. Remember, it says in Scripture that we are to call no man a fool. So, so we understand that the maker of heaven and earth can rightly see people's hearts, and he had the right to call these leaders a fool. 
He calls them bowls full of evil and tombs filled with rotting corpses. And let me suggest that if you're a dinner guest sometime in the next few days, I wouldn't recommend that kind of language toward the people who are hosting you. Don't anybody here call a host a rotting corpse. Okay, this is not a good thing for you or for me. And if you're sharing the good news with someone, maybe be careful not to call them unwashed holes full of filthy food. Okay? So, anyway, the Divine Son of God, though, fully knows the hearts of the people he's talking to. And he knows that they're set on rejecting the good that they have seen him do and the truth that they've heard him speak. He knows that their religion is play acting. So he calls them to account. And when he does, I think that his words help us think a bit more about what real practical righteousness looks like. When we were last looking at this passage, I laid some theological groundwork by talking about the two kinds of righteousness. We talked about positional righteousness. A righteous standing with God. Do you remember what that's called? Positional righteousness? A righteous standing with God? Pardon? Justification. Justification. Okay, that's the biblical word for positional righteousness. A righteous standing with God. It's justification. We know that justification, positional righteousness, a righteous standing with God, isn't about us. It's not about how good we are or how good we can be. It's about the righteousness of the perfect Son of God, our Savior King. He took our sin on himself when he was executed on the cross. And we are credited with his righteousness when we trust in him. That's what the old hymn is talking about, the old song uh, where it says, dress in his righteousness alone, Faultless I stand before the throne. Dressed in His righteousness alone. Faultless I stand before the throne. His righteousness, placed on our account, gives us the position, the standing of righteousness with God. If you've trusted Christ and you've accepted this gift, then when God looks at you, He doesn't see your sin. He sees Christ's righteousness. And that is a tremendous, tremendous word of hope. When God looks at those who have trusted in Jesus Christ, He doesn't see our sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Well, the second kind of righteousness that we talked about is what we might call practical righteousness. Now, the fancy theological word for practical righteousness is the word sanctification. How many of you have heard of sanctification before? Okay, so sanctification is about how we live and think, about the Spirit of God living through us so that we are becoming more and more like Jesus. That's what we're talking about when we think of growing and maturing in Jesus Christ. As we come to know Him, his sanctifying work in us means that as his disciples, we're becoming more and more like him. And as we're becoming more and more like him, that's far different than being, you know, as the phrase sometimes is used, holier than thou. This is more than the veneer, the outward show of religious practice. And that's why we find ourselves on this particular subject, the subject of practical righteousness. As Jesus sits at a dinner table with some of the most strictly religious people of his time. And what I want you to do right now is I want you to imagine yourself standing in that courtyard, outside of that home. Maybe you're standing with your back against the wall, side by side with some friends, looking on as this verbal battle takes place between Jesus and the other men at the table. And as we looked at it the last time we were together, Jesus said first that self-righteousness is not real righteousness, that holier than thou is not righteousness. And, and the other thing that Christ said when we looked at this last time was that real righteousness begins when we give him 
who we are deep down. Outward actions are just meaningless tokens. Outward gestures are just meaningless tokens. And so Christ said to them at that point, he said, you don't give God the alms that are just money thrown into a, thrown into a box. He said, the only real alms are the alms, first of all, of your inner life, of who you are deep down and fully. Give as alms those things that are within and behold, everything is clean for you. Well, today, as we continue on in the middle of this hostile meal, our Lord and Savior provides us with two more truths that help us understand the kind of righteousness that we want to be practicing as we look to Him and as we follow Him. And, and so this is the first thing that I'm going to say to you, continuing on at verse 42. Practical righteousness, practical righteousness majors on the majors. Practical righteousness majors on the majors. Have you ever heard someone say of another person, they can't see the forest for the trees? You ever heard that phrase before? Can't see the forest for the trees? When someone says that, or if you say it yourself, maybe, what you're saying is that someone is so nitpicky and focused on the details, little details, that they've taken their eyes off the purpose and meaning of those details. You get so caught up with the tiny little nitpicky details that you forget what really matters. Kind of like, for instance, if you decided you wanted to go out and buy a car, and what happened was you came on one that was the perfect color of pink that you were looking for, and you never opened the hood to look and see if it actually ran. So caught up with the color of the car that it doesn't matter if it's a jumper or not. Can't see the forest for the trees. As you listen on the conversation here, we are warned to not to be people who can't see the forest for the trees. And Christ starts out and says, Woe to you, Pharisees. Woe. That word woe means bad things are coming to you, Pharisees. Impending doom is ahead. And you're bringing it on yourselves. How? How are they doing this? Woe to you, Pharisees, for you, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. They were doing this by taking care of the minutia the tiny details of religious observance. They were tithing herbs and spices. Maybe they were going out to their herb garden and they were bringing in dill and they were shaking off all the dill seed and as they were taking a look at the little pile of dill seed that they had there, they would say, okay, nine seeds for me, one for you, God. Nine seeds for me, one for you. Nine seeds for me, one for you. They were actually taking and they were tithing right down to the point where they were tithing the very herbs growing in their garden. Now, tithing is good. The whole principle of thankfully acknowledging God as the giver of every good gift and exercising faith in His provision and even sharing with those in need through the tithe, this is good. But the Pharisee mindset was, we're so good at righteousness that we even tie our, tie our garden herbs. And Jesus says this. He says, the truth is, you do the formal details of worship, but you don't treat your neighbor well, and you don't love God. And we see more of what this means as it's explained to us in other places in Scripture. We see it the Pharisees and other religious leaders, and then even in the Old Testament prophets, we read of people who were intensely religious, but who, for instance, took advantage of the poor and weak and needy. There is talk in the Scripture of law courts that were unjust, of judges being bribed. Jesus says elsewhere of the Pharisees that they devoured widows' houses. In other words, they took advantage of them on every, in every legal way that they could because they would follow the letter of the law 
and they would do tremendous acts of evil and injustice inside of the letter of the law. Christ talks about them neglecting caring for their elderly parents, pretending that their religious duties that they've given everything to God so that they don't have to help mom and dad who are in a desperate place. Christ talks about the fact of them holding back wages from the workers. Actually, it's Christ's brother James who talks about that. He said, go to you rich people now, weep and howl because the wages of the laborers who are working in your field they're crying out against you because you have not provided in the way that you should for the laborers who are harvesting your fields. And in all of this, we get this picture, this picture of the fact that while they are being as religious as religious can be, they're not loving their neighbor as themselves. They're good at tithing bill seats, but they don't care about justice. James, as I said, James is the brother of Jesus. And James, the brother of Jesus, in his letter, reflects Jesus' heart when he says this to us. He says, pure religion, unpolluted religion before God and the Father is this, taking care of the most vulnerable in their need and keeping oneself holy to God. Pure religion Unpolluted before God and the Father is this, taking care of the most vulnerable in their need and keeping oneself holy to God. That's big picture. And that's exactly what Christ is saying here when he says, you've neglected justice and the love of God in your rush to tithe your dill seeds. Of course, the hardness and injustice that Jesus condemns here is a result of a lack of love. For God. The main big picture matter that they're missing. Because you see, if you love God, if you truly love God, it's because of the beauty of His character and goodness. He is the Father who is merciful and faithful and compassionate and loving. He's the strong protector. He's truth. He's goodness. And if you love the beauty and character of God, you want to emulate it. And if you want to emulate it, then you will want love and justice for your neighbor. Now, now I want you to notice this. I want you to notice that Jesus doesn't say that their worship practices are wrong, does he? He says, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So he doesn't say that their worship practices are wrong. Instead, he gives a both and perspective. He says, practical righteousness in our faith walk is big picture righteousness. And if we really see the beauty and character of God, we will love him. And because we love who he is, we will want to live that same beauty in this world toward other people. Those will be the majors. And we won't allow the minors and small things to consume us and for us to say, well, that's all that matters. And to replace the great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. It's kind of interesting because a rabbi from that time, uh, actually a little bit earlier, a rabbi named Hillel who had a, a tremendous, tremendous impact in the Jewish community. And, and I think that there was a lot about Hillel that was, that was very good, but Hillel makes this comment. He says, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, and all the rest is just details. All the rest is just details. That's right. The big picture. Practical righteousness majors on the majors. Second thing as we look at what Christ is saying in his, in his battle with these Pharisees is that he says practical righteousness must be our focus, not a facade. It must be our focus, not a facade. Now as I say this, we understand 
that we have righteous standing, that we are positionally righteous because of Christ's righteousness by the grace of God. And we know that in this life, we will never be fully who we ought to be. That is the reality of it. We will never be fully who we ought to be. But Jesus has a warning here for those who are faithful. He says, whoa, again, bad things are coming. You're bringing doom on yourself, impending doom. Bad things are coming to those who are faking righteousness or have a fake kind of righteousness. Now, fake righteousness can happen in the body of Christ. Shower up, do your hair real nicely, dress, show up for church, make it look like you're observing all the religious details of your life, but in the course of it, be living something entirely differently at home, away from everybody else, or toward others in the day, in, in the week, through the course of the week. PC culture has produced its own fake righteousness in our world. The, the politically correct culture has produced a self-righteousness in, in the secular world that's really interesting because a lot of times the most righteous things are in fact things that are biblically evil. The things that are held up as being most good are things that are clearly, clearly, according to our Creator, destructive and bad. But either way, Christ's warning tells us a couple of things about fake righteousness. Take a look at these words. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you're like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. Christ's warning tells us this about fake righteousness. It tells us first that fake righteousness is often done to gain the admiration and honor of the crowd rather than out of a true desire to do good and love for the good. And don't we see that all the time? People gravitating to what they consider to be the righteous position because they want the crowd to pat them on the back and admire them and say, look at the good person that person is. They're holding exactly the position that they're supposed to hold. The other thing that Christ tells us here is that fake righteousness stinks of death. He compares fake righteousness to an unmarked grave. There might be flowers and nice landscaping on the top, but inside there's a rotting and moldy corpse. And he tells the religious leaders that they like that corpse. My guess is that they weren't wanting to invite this guy out to dinner anytime real soon. But the reality of fake righteousness or a pretense of righteousness is that it's dead and it conceals death. Because you see, practical righteousness requires us to focus on the one who is life. We focus on Christ. We hunger for the beauty of what we see in Him. And so it says in Hebrews 12, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We look at Jesus as we run the race. That's why Paul says that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering. Most of the men reclining at the table on that day were too far gone. The rod of death had set in. Maybe some of them would even be part of the cruc crucifixion that was going to occur later on. But as we stand against the walls of the courtyard, looking at the conversation that's taking place around this table, we can learn from those spiritually dead men. We can learn from this confrontation. Because Christ says to us, don't fake it. Don't fake it. We want to be authentically focused on and looking to Jesus. Knowing that we will still fail. Knowing that we will still need to confess and be restored. But that, that is very different than putting on a religious veneer or a facade of goodness of being dead inside. No real love for God. No real desire to be like Jesus Christ. We're not saved by works. But Christ in his children makes us spiritually alive rather than simply being people who have the outer pretense and our inner stinking corpses. Jesus Christ 
has changed us and he is changing us if we are in him. And I will say this, if Christ is not who you long for, if Christ is not who you want, don't deceive yourself with the lie that you are spiritually alive. You're dead in a desperate state and maybe not even realizing it. Condemned by what you cling to. And Jesus Christ is your only hope for life. The Savior says to us too, if you're in Christ, then major on the majors. Religious practice without a love for your neighbors, without a love for the people around you, religious practice without love for God, is meaningless. As I said before, Christ's brother James tells us stuff about religious belief that's very much in concert with, in fact, we know is a complete reflection of what his brother Jesus said. And I want to read for you just in summary something that James says here as he talks to us about what practical righteousness looks like. Because we know, first of all, that he tells us that religious belief without practical righteousness is dead. You remember that? Faith without works is dead. That's saying religious belief without practical righteousness is dead. But listen to his summary of what true faith in Christ means. It's a, it's, a, it's a great summary at the end of James 1. He says this, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. In other words, in other words, if you use your tongue in destructive and hurtful ways, probably says that your faith is kind of empty. Then he says this, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. In other words, to be committed to caring for those who are vulnerable. Without any hope of reward or recompense. And to keep oneself unstained from the world. In other words, to seek, to desire, to live a life that is separate to, holy, and committed to God in the face of a culture that is committed to death. These, two, these three things are presented to us as kind of a summary picture of what it looks like to live as people who are practically righteousness. Are practically righteous. Careful about how we use our mouths, not destructive and helpful with our mouths. Committed to caring for and loving people even when they can't give us anything back. And committed to living for God, to living His holiness and His character in a world that goes against His holiness and character. Is that us? Jesus says to the religious leaders, you're just playing games. We don't want to play games. When I look at what's going on in families and churches and community and country and continent today, I think that we are more aware than ever before that our eyes must be fixed on Christ. We can't pretend. We can't play at our faith. We have to be people who have our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your Son, our Savior. We thank you that even in this moment of confrontation, as we see what Christ says to these religious leaders, we, we see not only what he is speaking against, but what he is pointing us toward. And we want to be people who love like Christ loved. We love our neighbors, we love you, who are seeking to live as followers whose eyes are fixed on the Savior. Help us to be people who make your own natures. Help us to be people who don't pretend, who aren't playing games with our faith. May Christ be at work in us, changing us, shaping us, 
making us more holy people who resemble him. I pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior. Amen. We, uh, we gather around the table now, and as we gather around the table, we gather knowing what Christ has done for us in order to bring us to positional righteousness, to give us a standing before God that means that we're forgiven. And at the same time, we recognize that as people who have trusted Christ and follow Christ, we want that positional righteousness to be then accompanied by lives that are more like Jesus Christ. And so as we gather at the table, we're going to take a moment and we're going to be involved in a, a moment of a silent self-examination, considering the goodness of God to us in Jesus Christ, considering what Christ did for us, what we're trusting so that we can come to him, but also making sure that as we come to the table, we are prepared to be involved in this as people who know Jesus Christ and not only know Jesus Christ, but have a right heart before him, gathered around the table. Christ our Savior died for us, and as he died for us, and then calls us to live for him, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear that we want to gather around the table in a manner that is right, that we want to honor Jesus Christ, both in what he's done for us, but also in who we are choosing to be right now. So let's take a period, a short time of silent self-examination, and then after that, uh, we're going to participate in the honors to come. With joy and gratitude that we're here today, gathered together as, as one to praise you, to worship you, and to partake of this bread, which is a representation of your body, which was broken for us so that we could be whole. So that being whole, you have saved us again to again be a part of your body. I pray that the meaning of this emblem would be impressed on each one of us Lord, as we partake. Pray to the same. Amen. You have the um, the elements that have been provided for you. And uh, this is, of course, an unusual way for us to be taking and participating in this. Um, but uh, we come together as the body of Christ and we understand what it is that we are recognizing uh, when, we, when we participate in this. And Jesus Christ said, this is my body that was broken for you. And uh, we think about that and we, and we know that what is being said in that is that Christ was our substitute, rather than us being broken, us being destroyed, Jesus Christ died for us. And as he died for us, as his body was broken for us, then his righteousness is placed to our account. And that's the positional righteousness 
that we talked about earlier, earlier on. But we recognize, too, that Christ's intent was never to, as he provided us with righteous standing before God, it was never to leave us in this place where what happens is all we are is positionally righteous. We know one day we will be glorified, we will be made holy who we should be, but we recognize in the meantime that we who participate in the body of Jesus Christ right now, as the body of Jesus Christ, are growing up into Christ. So Paul says these words, and we take a look in Ephesians, it says, it says to, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is worked properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Our righteous standing is due to the fact that Christ's body was broken for us. But then as we become the body of Christ, the body of Christ itself is to be growing up into Christ in very, very practical terms. This is the intent of Jesus Christ. He didn't just save us to fire insurance. Christ saved us to become like him. And so, let us eat this bread together. symbol of your death on the cross, the blood that was shed for us. We remember what you've done for us. We confess that we are but sinners saved by your grace. But Lord, we pray that your spirit in us would, would make us vibrant and alive and, and desirous of showing your love to all those around us in what we do and what we say and how we live. And Lord, help us to be your hands and your feet here on this earth. Help us to display your grace. And help us to be worthy of the sacrifice that you have made on our behalf. We will never be able to pay for it. We'll never be able to truly be worthy. But Lord, help us to live a life that brings honor and glory to you how worthy you are of all that honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name. As we come to the cup, we are reminded again of Jesus Christ's words in Matthew chapter 26, where he says, This is my blood that is shed for many for the remission of sins. And we, again, understand this whole idea of positional righteousness, the fact that because of what Christ did when he shed his blood on the cross for us, uh, our sin is paid for, our sin is covered, and, and we stand forgiven before God. But, but having said that, we again are reminded of, of the further and fuller explanation of, of what the implication of this 
is for us. When we take a look at Paul's words in Ephesians 5, and it says, uh, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And we understand the washing, the washing by the shedding of Christ's blood, that means that positionally we stand before God, but, but Christ's intent too is that, that we in some way, as the bride, even here, even now, reflect the beauty of what we will be. Christ's intent is that, that the followers of Jesus Christ, in some sense, reflect the beauty and the fullness of what we will finally be in His glorifying work. And so we drink this, recognizing that Christ cleaned us so that we stand clean before God. But now Christ calls us to live in cleanness before Him. Christ calls us to reflect who He is, to live as that beautiful bride in the world. So let us drink this together. going to uh, sing together uh, Lamb of Glory. And so I'm going to ask Matt if you would to put those words up. And uh, Then after we sing Lamb of Glory, I just want to take a moment and uh, we're going to do something uh, different than what we have done before. We've, over the course of the last few months, we've been doing all kinds of different things in different ways in order to adapt to our circumstances. But we have something joyfully different that we have to do in the next few minutes. So let's sing together, hear the story from God's Word. Okay, so for the moment, 
we suspend the physical practice. And we have a few people that we're welcoming into membership today. Uh, as you know, there was a vote last week, and over the course of that vote, we had some people who were already members as kids whose membership was affirmed by that vote. And so uh, Alana, Alana Tank and uh, Kelly Tamoyne were voted into, I, I believe I'm right on that, right? Alana and Kelly? Yeah. Alana and Kelly were voted into uh, adult membership, although they were all very, already very much uh, members in the body of Christ here, non-voting but members. But additionally, uh, we have welcomed into membership, or are welcoming into membership, uh, Harvey James and uh, Zeth and Christy Stutz. And we're very, very glad to be able to welcome you in. And at some point, we'll even be allowed to touch your hands. <laughs> so, in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, make sure that if you ha have the opportunity uh, before they get out the door, uh, well, actually, I think that Zeth's staying around. Harvey and Christy, you guys are, are you guys heading back now? Yeah. So, uh, just to make sure that you take the moment and you welcome them as far as welcome into our fellowship and to a membership here is concerned. So let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that uh, even as uh, life is uh, different on, on many counts at this time, at the same time, the, the eternal truths are real and unchanging. And we thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you that we can be a part of the body of Christ. And we thank you that because of your Son, Jesus Christ, we are joined together uh, by the Holy Spirit with one another. We thank you for those who have come into membership with us today. We thank you for uh, each one who is a part of the body here. And I pray that we would uh, love one another, that we would watch out for one another, and that we would walk alongside one another, encouraging one another. Thank you for the time that we've spent now, both in your word and around the table, remembering what Jesus Christ did for us so that we could be yours. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior.